there are many different definitions of chemistry. But the one I find very interesting is chemistry is where electrons are and how they flow. You can apply this definition to almost all chemical phenomena. In many cases, electron counting is always important because it can be used to predict and explain chemical bonding, the structure of molecules, and how reactive molecules are. There are several electron counting rules in chemistry, depending on the type of the molecules and the purpose of counting. For example, the octet rule is used for main group elements and small molecules such as carbon dioxide. The 18 electron rule is used for transition metal complexes. Huckel's rule is used for aromatic compounds. And Wade's rule is used for cluster compounds such as this borane cluster. In this video, I will talk about how to count electrons in transition metal complexes using the 18 electron rule. But first, let me go from the very fundamentals. What are transition metals? Transition metals are elements in this block of the periodic table. They include some familiar metals in daily life such as iron, copper, silver, or tungsten. These elements have one thing in common, that is a partially filled or incomplete D subshell. Surrounding an ion of a transition metal by organic molecules called ligands, we will have a transition metal complex or a coordination complex. The variety in structures and the rapid ligand assembly or disassemblies are what make these compounds very useful in industrial and biological catalysis. Now, let's talk about the 18 electron rule and where it comes from. Take copper as an example for a transition metal. The electron configuration of copper is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d10, and 4s1. The easiest way for copper to have a stable noble gas configuration is to lose one electron. This would yield the configuration of 18 electrons. And now, let's do some examples of counting electrons in transition metal complexes. Here, we have molybdenum hexacarbonyl. This complex has a molybdenum metal center surrounded by six carbonyl ligands. First, we need to add electrons to the oxygen atom so that they have eight electrons around them. Next, we are going to cleave the metal ligand bonds that give each ligand two electrons. Now, we need to find the charge of the ligand. Here, the formal charge of carbon and oxygen is one and negative one. This makes the charge of the carbonyl ligand zero. Therefore, the total ligand charge is zero. The oxidation state of metal is equal to the overall charge minus the ligand charge. And here, it is zero. Next, the electron from metal center is equal to the group number minus the oxidation state. Since molybdenum is in group 6, and its oxidation state is zero, the electron from molybdenum is 6. Finally, the total electrons of the complex is the sum of the electrons donated from the ligands and the electrons from the metal. In this case, we have the total electrons of 18. The next complex we have is the Wilkinson catalyst, which is used in hydrogenation of alkenes. This complex has a rhodium metal center surrounded by one chloride ligand and three phosphine ligands. First, we need to add some lone pairs to the chlorine ligand. Then, we heterolytically cleave the metal ligand bonds. From the formal charges, we know that the phosphine ligands are neutral and a chloride ligand has a negative charge. So the total ligand charge is negative one, which makes the oxidation state of rhodium plus one. Since rhodium is in group nine and has the oxidation state of plus one, the electron from metal in this case is eight. Now, because each ligand donates two electrons, the total electrons of the complex is 16. Transition metal complexes with 18 valence electrons are typically stable. Complexes with fewer or more than 18 electrons tend to be more reactive. Of course, there are several exceptions for this rule, but counting electron is one of the most fundamental ways to study the reactivity of transition metal complexes. Now, it is your turn to do some practice, and thank you for watching.